Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is um, welcome to the top tobacco online policy seminar tops. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Julia Chen Sankey, a tobacco control researcher at, currently at uh, NIH, and I'll be um, joining Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies in a couple of weeks. So it is my great honor to introduce you, the organizers of TOPS today. Um, they are Dr. Mike Pasco from Georgia State University, Dr. Catherine McLean from Temple University, Dr. Te Shan from The Ohio State University, and Dr. Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. Um, so the seminar you're attending today will be one hour with Q&A joined by our presenter, moderator, and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and then the moderator will draw from those questions and engage the conversation with the presenter and discussant. Um, please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org um, for um, acceptable comments. Please also keep the comments and questions uh, professional and they're related to the research being discussed today. Your comments and questions will also be shared with the um, presenter after today's seminar. The, this seminar is being video recorded and will be available to you along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. Uh, I would now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Dr. Te Shan from the Ohio State University, and then she will now introduce our speaker today. Uh, today, Victoria Baroni will lead a traditional single paper presentation entitled Tobacco Consumption Habits in Argentina, Evidence from a New Regulation. Victoria is a rising fifth year student at the Economics Department at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research interests lie in the intersection of health and public economics, and she is currently in the dissertation writing stage of her PhD. One strand of her research focuses on risky behaviors, in particular, her work titled The Opioid Epidemic, Causes and Consequences. Victoria and her co-author studied the origins of the opioid crisis and its effects on drug mortality and a host of economic and health variables. Our discussion today is Mike Pascal. Victoria will be presenting her research in three segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Victoria, thank you for presenting for us today. Cool, thank you so much, C, for the introduction and um, for the committee for including my paper. So I should be now sharing my screen. I hope you guys can see my slides. Let's go to presentation mode. Okay, so let's get started. I'm super excited to be presenting this paper, Tobacco Consumption Habits in Argentina, my home country, evidence from a new regulation. So before we get to the paper itself, uh, this study has received no external funding and I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose. So the main motivation for this research is that modifiable risky behaviors such as smoking tobacco are a major determinant of premature death, both in developed and developing countries. In fact, tobacco use is the leading risk factor in high-income countries and the second most important risk factor in middle-income countries. And because of this reason, uh, governments have tried to implement different policies to curb tobacco consumption. And uh, tobacco has long been heavily taxated, as we have discussed previously. But uh, in most recent, in most recent uh, time, the non-price policies have become increasingly common. What do I mean by non-price policies? Are policies that do not rely in tobacco price changes. So these policies are particularly important in middle and low-income countries where tobacco use is concentrated among low-income consumers, low-income households, because they have the opportunity to curb tobacco consumption at the time of not increasing the economic burden of tobacco use. In particular, I will be studying two types of these policies, place-based bans, which are basically restrictions on where people can consume um, tobacco products, and graphic tobacco warnings, which I will show you an example in some minutes, uh, but these are basically shocking pictures that are displayed on uh, tobacco cigarettes, in, on tobacco packaging. So the main question I would like to, uh, to tackle in this project is what is the causal effect of non-price policies on smoking prevalence, alcohol consumption, and health outcomes. 
I will do this in the context of uh, Argentina, which is a middle income country. I will give you more details in a second, but I will be taking advantage of a policy change that happened at the federal level in 2011. And I will exploit differences in state level regulations before the policy change. So basically, this is a pol Argentina is a federal country like the US. So this is a policy that happened at the federal level. And I will be exploiting differences in the state level uh, policy landscape before the policy happened. So the basic idea behind my identification strategy will be that um, states will be, dif we will be basically treated with different intensities in a way. So we can think of more linear states, individuals in more linear states, and I will be comparing how their outcomes look like relative to individuals who are in already very strict uh, states. I will um, to answer this question. I will use data on from three different sources. So first, I compile data on tobacco regulation from state status and laws. So I, this is just self uh, compiling, reading the laws. I use data on individual level consumption and, um, sm and alcohol, uh, smoking and alcohol consumption, which come from two national surveys. I will give you more details in a couple of slides. And I have restricted access to some administrative data on hospital discharges, which, will, uh, which I will be using to measure the health outcomes. So just to quickly preview my results, um, I find that this policy effectively curved tobacco consumption with a reduction in the share of current smokers and the cigarette smoke per day. But this policy also disproportionately benefited uh, more uh, educated and richer individuals. So how I see this paper contributing to this literature is in basically two strands of the literature, the effects on place-based bans. So this has been a study from a variety um, of policy changes. So research based on North America basically shows mixed results with some paper finding uh, null effects or some paper finding small effects um, in terms of reducing smoking uh, consumption. Research from Europe, it basically finds uh, reductions of a small magnitude in smoking behavior. But we, do, uh, we know less about how these policies work in developing countries where about 80% of tobacco consumers are uh, living. So this paper aims to contribute to the previous literature and complement it in a way uh, by drawing, like, by providing causal estimates of this policy change in the context of a developing country where 80% of uh, tobacco consumers live. I also will dig into the effects of graphic warning labels. So graphic warning labels are um, a policy instrument that, have, that has been widely studied. But studying uh, the policy effect of this from uh, actual changes in policies, not from the lab, it's uh, been very challenging because most of the time these type of policies are implemented as part of a more uh, general anti-smoking campaign and um, research based on actual consumption is limited. So I will also try to, I will, uh, this paper will also be providing some uh, new evidence in this regard. So the, the rest of the talk uh, for today, I will give you more institutional details on Argentina, and I will explain um, this, uh, my identification strategy. Then we will talk about the data, the empirical strategy, and the results. So the context of this paper is Argentina, a middle-income country. I would say it's a, high, uh, it's a country where there is a high prevalence of smoking, so about 29% of the population uh, smokes. And a very low prevalence of electronic cigarettes. Maybe this will surprise some of you, uh, but only 1% of the population has declared having used this type of devices. So this is very different from the current states in the US. There is a very low prevalence of electronic cigarettes. And as I was mentioning before, Argentina is a federal country, which means that the states in Argentina have some autonomy to implement different regulations. And I will be taking advantage of this. So the policy change that I, I evaluate is the 2011 federal law. So this happens at the national level and it has two main components. It introduced place by bans, which basically are restrictions on where people can smoke by um, imposing restrictions on smoking indoors, in bars, restaurants, public and private workplaces. And it also introduced these graphic tobacco warnings, which I will show you an image in a minute. And I 
I'm sorry, these are not nice to have in a presentation, uh, but just to convey the point, uh, basically these are printed in um, one side of cigarette packages, of cigarette boxes. They first have a, a, a text message with a side effect of smoking. You can read the English version here in the footnotes. And then this is complemented with a joking image of the side effects of smoking for health. So basically this uh, federal law happened in 2011, but what I will be, uh, and, and it happened in, in, the, in the entire country at the same time, right? So, so how I will try to, to use this policy change is by taking advantage that before this uh, policy happened, there was variation across the states in how strictly states regulated tobacco products. So you can think of this type of research design to be applicable in to other settings and to other policy changes, where basically there is a national or federal uh, regulation, but the states um, differ in how they were regulating this uh, consumption before this national change. So in order to know how states were regulating, what I did was collected the, the data by hand. So basically I read uh, the different status laws and uh, here it comes another challenge. So basically these laws will give us some qualitative type of data in terms of what you can and we, what you cannot do uh, regarding smoking in a given state. So to try to capture how um, strict states were before 2011, what I do is I try to summarize this uh, regulatory landscape in a legislation index. Let me show you a map uh, to see what do I mean by that. So basically this is a map of Argentina where each of the 23 states is colored using uh, this legislation index where darker shades in, um, indicate that the state was more strict. Okay, so for instance, we have here one of the states in the north part of the country. It has the lighter color. This means that in this state, um, tobacco sales to min um, minors of 18 years old were banned. But for instance, you can smoke inside a bar. Whereas in the more strict states, like these dark blue states in the middle of the country, Tobacco sales were also one to minors, but you cannot smoke inside um, bars and restaurants. Okay, so I have this variation across the states in how strict uh, states were in terms of uh, smoke, uh, in terms of tobacco consumption. And what I will do is uh, try to exploit that in uh, for my identification strategy. So the idea is that basically states with more lenient regulations were more affected by the new regulation than the states that were already very strict. So following our, my previous example, <clears throat> we were thinking that we have two um, states with different regulatories, uh, with, with different regulation before 2011, where we have some state that was lenient and another state that was an strict state. So when the policy change happened, it's true, every state, state got treated in the terms of that the federal law was more, more strict than what we have seen before. But this means that in a strict states, the change that we will be observing in terms of uh, the regulation is less intense than the change that we will observe in, in linear states in terms of the regulation. So basically what I will be doing is exploiting these state level differences in the strength of tobacco products regulation before the federal law. And I will be comparing individuals in linear states and strict states in order to draw the causal, in order to learn the causal effects of this uh, change. So I, I think that here is a good place to, to stop and see if the audience has uh, any questions. Um, Victoria, thank you. I don't think we have any open Q&A so far. Mike, do you have any comments? Um, well, just just maybe a clarifying question about the um, uh, the the index. Um, like, for example, yeah. how many how many states then did not ban the sale of cigarettes to uh, to youth? That oh, would be okay. one of yeah. the one of the <clears throat> parts of your index, right? Mm -hmm. I was curious how many states have that in particular. Yeah. Uh, so in particular, okay, uh, in particular, banning uh, sales to youth is actually um, every state banned uh, sales to youth, but some states banned uh, other stuff on top of that. 
So if we go back mm. to the map, the, the lighter color, you get it by just banning uh, self to youth. If you get one extra color, so for instance here, that means that you also uh, has banned advertising in, in some venues. So for instance, you cannot advertise uh, tobacco products in sport events, uh, or the advertising on TV mm -hmm. is limited to uh, some times um, of the day. So the, the, it's good. Uh, thanks for your follow-up question, Mike. So the legislation index uh, has um, one disadvantage that changes of one unit in the legislation index are not uh, comparable in the sense that if I go from the shy, from the lowest color to one more dark color, we're saying, okay, like now you cannot um, advertise tobacco products, but the next change will be, for instance, you cannot smoke. Uh, in hospital or in public transportation. So th that is a disadvantage um, because we are trying to compare laws, not trying to compare something that can actually be measured by, by an index. Um, so what I will actually be doing is instead of exploiting these unitary changes in the legislation index, I will use the legislation index to learn which states were lenient states and which states were strict states. So when I am talking about the strict states, I will be thinking of a state that has a legislation index above three. And when I talk about linear states, uh, those are states that has a legislation index less than three. So basically for you to, to think about the regulatory landscape and a strict state bans sales to youth and also has already implemented these restrictions on where you can smoke, for instance, bars, restaurants, it varies a little bit between states, but it's that type of landscape. And a more lenient state is a state where you ban uh, sales to youth and maybe some advertising, but there is not much on top of that. Um. Thanks, so, uh, Victoria. We have some Q and A's coming in. So uh, James Prager is asking: Did any states implement stricter laws? For example, stricter place-based uh, bans that go beyond the federal restrictions? Oh, that's a really good question. So no, that, that's why I, in this graph I I draw the federal law actually above. So the federal law was uh, the most strict law that was implemented at the na at the national and state level. And after this was implemented, everyone, regardless of where they live, have to obey by this federal law. Okay, um, there is another question from Christopher Carpenter. Can you describe the strengths of tobacco regulation in border countries and how you will account for those differences in uh, the research design? Also, can you clarify where most of the population centers are? Oh, yeah, sure. So let's uh, tackle the population center first. So, most of the population lives in the central part of the country. So the capital city is located here. I will say that this is the biggest state in terms of population and it's followed by these two states. But in general, the most uh, populated centers are uh, these states in the middle and uh, north part of the country. And regarding um, if I can compare countries, like if I can do this a cross border type of comparison, that's something um, that I cannot really do because I observe, I will come back to this later, but my, quick, my short answer will be that I observe in the, where individuals live at the state level, but I do not know if they're located like in the border of the states or in the middle of the states. So I cannot actually try to do something with um, a, like a border discontinuity design. Thank you. Okay, so, thanks Victoria. I, I had one other question as well. Um, yeah. Uh, are are you sh are we sure that the the graphic warning label um you, you're just we're describing that as like a non price um increase and and I you know it's definitely a non tax increase right um is there mm -hmm. any reason to think that the graphic warning label might have uh, increased the price of packaging uh, for example or is it possible that it was too hard to comply with that law by some of the tobacco um, producers. And so they dropped out of the market, maybe affecting kind of market concentration and affecting mm -hmm, price through mm -hmm. that channel. Uh, yeah, those are great questions. I will show you a graph uh, on prices. So uh, what I, well, it, it could happen, right? So it's kind of like an empirical question, right? Uh, so we don't, I do not see changes in prices after the, the introduction of the graphic warning labels. And um, what I, 
what I have collected, uh, so this is a little bit more informal, I don't have it like in the paper yet, but um, I do not observe changes also in how the market concert, concentration was before and after the, the law, at least for some like anecdotal evidence. Um, yeah. Okay. And just one institutional detail I thought I would throw mm -hmm. in there. Um, I just checked really quick um, the Johns Hopkins uh, website on e-cigarette regulations. And I believe in Argentina, um, the, the sale and production distribution of e-cigarettes is banned there. So that would probably explain the very low e-cigarette use. Yes, there. exactly. Yeah. Thanks, my for in that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the case in Argentina. Okay, so regarding the data I will use for this project, I observed tobacco and alcohol consumption data for two from two different uh, surveys. Um, these uh, surveys covered some years before and the year of the implementation. So I observed individuals in 2008, 9, in 2011, and 2013. So I only have one um, year after the, um, the, the national law. These, uh, these, the, the, these surveys provide individual level data and um, I do observe smoking behaviors. I will be considering three different outcomes. So I will classify individuals where they are never smokers, current smokers, and among current smokers, I will uh, see how many cigarettes they smoke per day in the last month. In order to assess uh, where this type of regulation has some uh, secondary effects on alcohol consumption, I also construct outcomes on alcohol consumption in the last month. I will not get uh, into this during today's presentation, but it's in the paper, uh, so I can refer you to the paper if you're really curious about my results uh, on alcohol consumption. Regarding health outcomes, this is the, the source um, of the data that is not uh, publicly available. But uh, so I draw on hospital discharges uh, data. And basically from here, I will construct the prevalence rate of two main diagnoses, chronic obstruct obst obstructed pulmonary disease and respiratory system related cancers. So we might be worried that uh, since uh, the data that I'm using for tobacco and alcohol consumption is self-reported, there could be some measurement error in this data. So what, what something that I can do is compare how the, the trends that come from this data look relative to the trends that come from sale data. And what I do observe is that these two go uh, in the same direction and that actually um, maybe like our intuition regarding where people um, underreported smoking is confirmed when I, confer, when I con compare consumption coming from survey data with consumption with sales data. But importantly, I observe that the underreporting of smoking does not change after the policy was implemented. So in general, uh, the proportion of consumption data to sales data in terms of consumption is, is stable across time. So, okay, the, um, just to give you some summary statistics, what I'm, see, what I'm showing here are the main outcomes of this paper, and I, I'm showing all the states. So this will be the baseline for the entire population of Argentina. And then I split this between a strict state and linear states, where I will be thinking that linear states are those states that actually were treated in a way, and strict states are the states that I will be using as my comparison group. And then in the fourth column, I will be showing uh, a test for the, the p-value for the test of equality of means. So basically what we see in this table is uh, that regarding the main outcomes of interest, there is balance between uh, states, uh, individuals in strict states and linear states. We observe that for extensive margin outcomes, meaning uh, the proportion of never smokers and current smokers. I, we also observe that uh, for um, intensive margin outcomes, so the amount of cigarettes that smokers smoke. I do detect some differences in, um, in some of these beans, meaning that this is some suggestive evidence that in a strict state, the, the distribution was a little bit more to the left, meaning that it, on average, uh, individuals that smoke less. Um, and regarding health outcomes, I do not observe um, difference, significant differences among strict and linear states. 
So my empirical strategy will rely in this um, change in 2011 that happened at the national level. Uh, so what I will be doing is the, the main, uh, I will be taking this model to the data. Let me decompose this model for you. So the main, um, the independent variable here is years after treat. So this variable will be measuring uh, time relative to low implementation. So I do observe individuals two years before and one year after the law was implemented. I interact this variable to, uh, with a treatment dummy, which basically indicates where the individual is in a comparison state, that means a strict state, or the individual is in a treated state that is a linear state. So where the individual face, you can think of this intuitively on where the individual face a big change in the regulation. So that will be a strict state, uh, sorry, a treaty state and where the individual did not experience such a big change in the regulatory environment. I will also, so basically the main outcome or the, the main uh, parameter of interest will be the estimation of this Delta Tau where I do have two years before, one year after. So the years before will be testing uh, for pre-trends in the outcomes of interest. So there will be informative on where the comparison and treated states were actually comparable in terms of observable characteristics. And um, the, the delta for one year after will be indicating the effect of uh, the national law a year after the implementation. And I will also control for a set of observable characteristics at the individual level and some observable characteristics at the state level where I am controlling for private employment and population just to uh, take into account this difference on how populated some states are and how economically uh, active uh, states are. I also add uh, states and, and year fixed effects. So I do a bunch of checks uh, on where, um, to basically provide evidence on where this strategy regarding the, the validities of the assumptions behind this empirical strategy. Um, I will not get into too many details on this so we can have more time for the results, but something that I would like to show you. So we already, already kind of like discussed how the, the first item here and how they compare in terms of outcomes of interest. I also check uh, where the individuals in uh, how observable characteristics that are similar across uh, between uh, strict and linear states. And I observe um, no big differences in terms of basic demographics, educational level. I do observe difference in terms of um, the income of these individuals. So I will be adding as a control variable how uh, the, the quintile of, um, of the individual. So here maybe we can do another pause before I jump into the results. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do you have any comments here? Um, uh, maybe I, I missed it, but did you talk about the survey data that you use in the, uh, in the study? Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, of course. Uh, so I use data from these two surveys, which I see uh, we shared the links on the, uh, on the chat. So these surveys ask individuals on uh, their smoking behaviors. Basically, they ask where they have uh, smoked cigarettes or not. And if they have smoked cigarettes, they ask about how many cigarettes they smoke per day in order to assess where this is like a habit that the individual has or not. So when I am talking about never smokers, it's, it's uh, individuals that have either never smoke or they have a smoke like one or two cigarettes in their entire life. Actually, the threshold there is like 100 cigarettes in their entire life. And when I talk about individuals as current smokers, uh, these are individuals that report smokely, uh, smoking either daily or every uh, or more than um, they, they, they sorry they report smoking either daily or uh, every every day uh, all, or many, many days in a given week. So basically these uh, current smokers will be individuals who we could say have taken up the, the habit of smoking. And you don't have any more data uh, after the intervention that we could bring into the analysis? So there is one extra year uh, of data, but it's in 2018. Um, so in a way, 
I think that that will be, uh, be asking a little bit too much from the research design because uh, after uh, 2011 national law was passed, there were also some price changes that happened in 2014, 2015, 2016. So as we were discussing, as I was mentioning before, around this time, I do not see big changes in, in the prices of cigarettes. But when we move forward in time in order to kind of like assess a more like long term effects of this policy change, there will be some price changes which I think can um, contaminate what, what I am estimating here. Um, mm -hmm. So al also that, that data became available after I started this research. Yeah. Uh, so they, they published it like a year ago or so. So I have not really, really drawn on the 2018 data. Mm -hmm. and, and how quickly would we expect if, if the policy is effective in changing um, smoking, um, would we expect uh, to observe effects on these types of hospitalizations um, uh, that quickly after 2011. Um, you know, I guess I'm kind of skeptical on that, especially yeah, the, no, the, I ladder, get it. The, the respiratory system related cancer one. Exactly. Um, but I'm just curious to hear. I don't know. Your, okay, your yeah, I, I will be presenting these uh, results. Uh, so I, I actually like this analysis because of two reasons. One reason is that it uh, I do observe a little bit of a longer pre-trend for uh, hospital discharges, which means that uh, I can observe where, whether states that were more strict uh, before the law was implemented were actually uh, those states where more individuals were affected by uh, side effects of smoking and they were doing a, a, a sooner policy change. Uh, so that's something that I like uh, to check with this analysis and I observe no uh, difference between the states uh, in that regard. But uh, th these two types of diseases are very different. So I totally agree with you. Uh, observing changes in respiratory system related cancers on the short term is something that it, uh, it it won't happen, right? And I do not find any significant effects there. But observing changes in the hospitalization of, uh, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease could be related to, to individuals smoking less and then having just less symptoms. So even though they're not fully recovered, they may have less um, episodes that, that end up in hospitalization needs. So in this, in this sense, hospitalization is a good measure since it will be capturing some uh, alleviations of symptoms and not uh, necessarily uh, people totally recovering from this disease because of the reduction in smoking. But I do agree with your intuition uh, that observing uh, this in the very short term will be hard. And maybe we can come back when I present these results. Yeah, um, we have some Q and A questions, mm -hmm. Q and A box, but I think uh, let's save those uh, for the last session uh, of Q and A, um, so you can continue. Uh, okay, great. Okay. So this is the first set of results. I am presenting this using this uh, event uh, event study like uh, graphs where I am showing the estimates of the pre-period uh, for 28, 28 and 29. Uh, these outcomes are the proportion of never smokers on the left-hand side and the proportion of poor and smokers on the right-hand side. And um, so first, uh, looking at the pre-trends here, the estimates of the pre-policy period coefficients, I do not detect any significant changes between comparison and treaty states. And what I find is that uh, there is an increase in the proportion of never smokers of um, about 10% and a reduction on the proportion of current smokers that it's about 22%. So in this regard, in terms of extensive margin outcomes, the law effectively reduced smoking participation, measuring it with these um, two outcomes. Then uh, I ask where this reduction uh, in, um, uh, in a smoking also happened at the intensive margin. So basically I construct outcomes that measure how much smokers currently smoke. And I do this in bins of five cigarettes. Uh, this I, and 
sorry, I do this in four bins of five, um, five cigarettes, and then I switch to 10. So basically, um, between um, the, those smokers who report smoking more than 50 cigarettes, th these are per day. So this will be a lot. So I do not use those who decide to report more um, than, um, than 50. And um, basically, uh, what I do observe is that there are uh, there is a sharp decrease in the amount of cigarettes. Sorry, in the proportion of individuals that smoke less than five cigarettes, and there are increases in the proportion of individuals that uh, smoke between five and twenty cigarettes, with no changes in the very right part of this uh, consumption measure. So. Basically, the way I'm interpreting this is that, okay, we know that there are some reductions on the extensive margin level. So some people, um, are, th th we have a proportion of the population who is not smoking anymore. Then among those who keep smoking, we do observe a reduction um, on uh, those who are light smokers, but there are some people in the middle of this distribution who are not responding too much to this policy change, okay? So <clears throat> here we can think uh, that uh, these individuals who are between five and 20 cigarettes per day um, have a more, um, have a harder time to quit smoking than those who are having a, a light consumption. And that's why we will be observing changes in this uh, left, um, in this first part of the distribution. I also do some heterogeneity analysis. So uh, in this graph, I am showing the results of um, the probability of being a current smoker for, for different age groups. And I also split this for men and women because, uh, well, this is the case in Argentina and in other countries, but females do smoke uh, less than men. So um, what I'm showing here are the uh, coefficient estimates of the post period. I am not showing you the pre-trends um, because the graph will be <laughs> a little bit too much. So we are just looking, inspecting at the post period here. And uh, what we observe is that the, if the, the reduction in the proportion of current smokers uh, basically comes from either young individuals, so between 18 and 25 years old, and for individuals between 40 and 55 years old. And I find that this uh, pa pattern of results happen both for female and for men. And I do not see a statistical difference between these coefficients. I also study this um, for educational levels and income levels. So here, what we observe in both graphs, again, this is the post period coefficient, but what we are observing in both of them is this uh, gradient where individuals who are either more educated or are um, in households with a higher income level uh, experience um, we estimate uh, a bigger reduction in the probability that these persons are, that these individuals are current smokers. So I was mentioning before in my preview of the results, what we observe here is that the law um, basically help individuals on more educated, um, more educated individuals on more, uh, on, on richer households more. Um, yeah. Okay, regarding health outcomes, so I anticipated a little bit of this discussion. Um, so something that I would like to add on what I previously said is that why I select these two outcomes. So ex ante is hard, I would say, to select which outcomes to look at because the smoking can basically, uh, the smoking has side effects that can be other than um, obstructive uh, pulmonary disease and, and um, respiratory system related cancers, but I will focus on these two because these two type of hospitalization, these two type of outcomes has been linked to smoking. And um, so as we were, as I was mentioning, reducing smoking in public places could entail uh, these health benefits on both smokers and non-smokers. And let me just uh, highlight the fact that what I'm doing right now is looking at changes at the population levels, because one, um, 
one disadvantage of this data is that I cannot observe whether an individual is a smoker or not. Okay, so I only observe um, hospitalization discharges, but I, I do not have in that data the smoking status of the individuals. So this will be an analysis on the entire population. Uh, so basically, the mechanism that could be behind the results is the fact that reducing smoking in public places will affect both smokers and non-smokers. And since one big component of this uh, law was uh, the implementation of these clean indoor air policies, uh, this I cannot tell where the reduction, where the effects that we will observe in health outcomes are coming from smokers and non-smokers. So, so I, I, I want to make that very clear. Uh, so again, I will be showing you event, um, event study graphs. So here I have uh, also data for 2010, and I actually observed data for each year after the implementation and until 2014. And um, what we observe is, well, first inspecting the pre-trends, we do not observe differences in terms of health outcomes between comparison and treated states, which is something that ex ante I would be worried about since um, the strict or comparison, sorry, the strict or linear status is not completely random, okay? And uh, what I do observe is that there are some gains in terms of uh, the prevalence of chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease. And I do not detect any effects on cancers of the respiratory systems. The main reason why this may be happening, as we were discussing before, are basically um, the, the, the time span that I am analyzing and uh, we cannot wait for this outcome to, to respond that quickly. Okay, uh, so regarding of time, I think that I'm doing well, but I will just try to wrap up so we have more time to for the for the discussions. So just to summarize what we have uh, seen today. So what I'm doing in this paper is exploiting regional variation in the leniency of uh, tobacco regulation before 2011 to identify the effects of a ch policy change that happened at the federal level. So I exploit uh, the difference on, on, um, on tobacco regulation before that uh, federal policy change. Uh, the, main, the main results of the paper suggest that this policy was effective in curbing uh, smoking initiation and consumption, but that they were more effective for more educated and, and richer individuals. And I will stop here so we can uh, have more time for questions. Uh, Feedback. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. That was also great. And uh, let's um, answer the questions in Q&A first, and uh, we'll move on to Mike uh, to see if he has any additional questions. Okay. There is one question from Mariana um, about the uh, enforcement of the laws. And mm. it is possible that the strict states in terms of regulation actually behave like what you considered uh, treated states. So can you comment on those? Yeah, great question. Thank you so much. Um, so, okay, having uh, data on enforcement of the law uh, was hard to get. So I tried to get uh, either type of like uh, fines uh, data or things like that, and I couldn't. So what I do in the paper, I don't have that in today's presentation, I'm sorry about that. But what I do in the paper is in one of these surveys, I do have one uh, question that asks uh, individuals where they have been exposed to second, uh, secondhand smoking. Basically, where they have been um, in a close environment with another individual who was smoking there. And what I do with this question, which I only have after the, the policy change, what I do with this question is I look at where a strict state and linear states come, uh, behave in, the, in a similar way to try to infer where the policy was, um, um, where the, these states actually um, implemented the federal policy at the same rate. Um, what I find is that there are reductions uh, for all states regarding whether uh, individuals were exposed to secondhand smoking. I do find bigger reductions for uh, secondhand smoking exposure in bars and restaurants, which is something that I ex ante expected because uh, more strict states were already um, 
implementing this type of regulation. So individuals located in those states shouldn't uh, be, we shouldn't expect bigger changes there. Uh, but in more linear states, uh, we do observe that type of change. So that's some evidence that I can give regarding uh, law enforcement, but uh, I know it's not perfect. It was really hard to get data on law enforcement. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, and another question from Kate Carpenter. So can you look at hospital discharges for alcohol involved car accidents? Prior to Ooh. the federal reform, people may have driven across states to go to bars where they could smoke and that channel will be closed down after the federal reform. Um, I like that, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thanks, uh, Kit. Um, so, no, I, I, I think that I do have that. So, so yeah, I, I totally can do it. Yeah, uh, I haven't done it. Uh, so, basically, yeah, yeah, I have the universe of hospital discharges and I have different types of, uh, and I have uh, that classified with the ICD-9 or 10 classification. So, yeah, that's something that I can definitely implement in the paper, thanks. Okay, so the next, next question is about, uh, I think, uh, related to the slides you just presented about the diseases. Uh, what about the typical time delay between start or end of smoking and the onset of smoking related diseases? Yes, yeah, so, so that's something, um, yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. So when we are looking at health outcomes, there will be this delay, uh, as uh, I was mentioned in the question, between the onset of the disease um, and the, the moment you decide to start smoking. Unfortunately, I cannot do this by smokers and non-smokers because it, it will be really cool to see where these, these differ. My intuition is that they will. Uh, so. Yeah, so the, the way I'm interpreting this is suggestive uh, that at the population level, there was a, a small reduction in the number of discharges for hospitalizations of chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease, meaning that uh, either there are less episodes or that the episodes that happened were less, um, less severe, which didn't uh, require uh, hospitalizations. So yeah. th this analysis is like suggestive on what's happening at the population level, and I cannot really tell between smokers and non-smokers. Yeah, I think you know one thing that you might be able to do is to look at uh, what the impacts on the older smoking population, because mm. that would be the population where you see a lot of uh, health consequences. So if you mm -hmm. all the policies reduce smoking among that particular population, that may go along with the evidence that you see here. If you see any impact on COPD or uh, respiratory system. Okay, yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, that's something I can do. Yeah, uh, another question from Kate. So what do you think uh, drives the education heterogeneity? Where the high oh, are nice. more likely to go to the venues that are newly restricted? Were they more discussed or socially embarrassed by the graphic? <laughs> um, yeah, so and they have done some live um, or discrete choice experiments on graphic labels, um, also exhibited this education heterogeneity, do lab or DCEs um, so show any uh, education heterogeneity? Do, are you aware of um, this type of literature? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question too. So my intuition behind this result is that um, it's, so it's not only about the incorporation of play safe bands, but it's also about the incorporation of the graphic warnings, uh, as, the, uh, as it was mentioned in the question. So I think that um, even though individuals know that the smoking is bad, these graphic warning, warnings were, were making some of the side effects of smoking much more salient. So in that regard, the policy change also have like an information component uh, in terms of the side effects of smoking. And uh, this information component could respond. So, so individuals with uh, more education or, or with a higher income can respond more to this type of informational component. Um, so I think that this is related to with, with this gradient on, um, on education that we see. But I could definitely check <clears throat> where the, the results of graphic warnings analysis by, uh, in, the, in the lab, or like experiment, experiment uh, settings uh, also display this. I don't have any paper in top of my mind, but I will definitely dig into that. Thanks. 
Related to this, uh, there is another attendee asking, um, he wonders if the bigger effect on the more educated groups reflects the more educated individuals working doors and that that's more subject to smoking restrictions. Can you comment on that? Would that be a possibility? Oh, sorry, I didn't totally understand the question. Oh, yeah, so the, the, um, the bigger effect on more educated groups reflects that the more educated individuals work indoors and are thus more subject to smoking restrictions because- Ah, uh, okay, okay. They're more likely to take, you know, uh, white collars. Yeah, things like yeah. That. Um, I'm trying to think if that's an analysis that I can. Um, so it, it's, it's a channel that I cannot rule out, but I cannot also present uh, evidence to support. Um, yes, uh, I think that the, the survey data is not great in terms of where individuals are smoking. Um, I do agree that what we can think of is, okay, uh, these individuals are more, uh, have more hours on the office, where now they, they are more restricted, they have to leave the office to smoke, so that there will be a channel through which uh, they will experience a higher uh, effect, but uh, something that I cannot really tell. Mm -hmm. So the next question is from James. Um, and then he wants to know, is it right to say that any impacts of graphic health warnings are not included in the DD effect sizes since they were new everywhere and are taken out by the year fixed effect? So you also oh. see the place-based bands effect, is that the case? Okay, so regarding the effects of tobacco graphic warnings, so I wasn't, uh, I didn't present these. Uh, you can, I, I will refer you to the, to the paper to see more on this section where I try to actually disentangle the effects of place of bans from the effect of tobacco graphic warnings. So from the policy change itself, I cannot do this, but um, what I do is use a different source of variation in the data. And I also combine this with some assumptions. I'm sorry, I'm doing this uh, a little bit sketchy at the moment. Uh, but basically what I do observe is that uh, tobacco graphic warnings were effect, effective in both outcomes. So um, in, the in the increase that we observe of never smokers and in the reduction that we observe on current smokers. And um, yeah. So, uh, uh, and the fixed effects, the time fixed effects in the, in the specifications. Um, so basically, Yeah, that, that will be my answer. Sorry, I was getting myself into a more complicated route, but I think that's fine. Yeah, um, so Mike, do you have any final comments? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, I, thought, I think this is, a, this is a great paper. Uh, thanks so much for coming to, um, to present it uh, uh, for us. Uh, you know, I was thinking a little bit more about the, the hospitalizations um, mm. part, right? And, and so, you know, that is, uh, you, you kind of described it as like a severe form of um, medical condition, right? But of course, mortality would be the most severe, right? That doesn't result yeah. in, in um, a hospitalization. Um, and so actually, I kind of was thinking in, you know, I guess a less severe form could be ED visits, possibly, right? Or outpatient mm -hmm. kind of visits, right? Um, so I, I don't know if there's other data that could be drawn in, um, especially like mortality data, uh, uh, to, to look at this. Um, and if that could be another way to, to get at this question. Yeah, those are great suggestions, Mike. Um, so I don't have the mortality data at the moment, but that's something that I can definitely try to get. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I I keep, when you presented the never smoking uh, results, right? And we see that yeah. large reduction in never smoking. Like, I kind of wondered, like, is this like a falsification, you know, exercise? Um because, you know, it, I think it would really depend. I don't know what the situation is in Argentina, but at least in the United States, you know, almost 95% of smoking starts before the age of 18, right? And so you have kind of adults in your data and you have three year support mm -hmm. data. So granted, there could be some kids that are affected that then come up and now they make up a small share of your adult population, right? Uh, but for the vast majority of your adult sample, they shouldn't change their never smoking status if they're not initiating an adulthood, right? Um, mm. uh, and so it kind of it kind of makes me think there is some 
undesirability bias of the national policy. Um, and I, I, you know, so I think that that could, if we compensated for that, that might attenuate your effect sizes, uh, as somewhat mm. of current smoking, which actually I think is reasonable because this seems really large to me. The, the, okay. um, uh, and so I guess I, I would, I would think about maybe going, I know you mentioned you had sales data and you, you showed, um, kind of how they, they track kind of closely with mm -hmm. each other, mm -hmm. you know, although, you know, it really depends on the, the last year is like your, basically your, your post period, right? Or the, I guess, 2011, 2013. Um, so I would just consider redoing this in the sales data um, uh, yeah. to, um, to, to see if the, if the results are, you know, the same there or a little bit different. And I might expect yes. they would be attenuated in the sales yeah. data. Yeah, no, yeah, that's a great point, Mike. Thanks so much. Uh, I really wanted to do that analysis, but I couldn't get the, the, the sales data at the state level. Uh, that's why the, the only thing that I'm doing is tracking mm -hmm. these changes just to see the direction of right. some measurement so, error. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what yeah about, it will be great. Will be what, great. what about just tax paid? Uh, so the states they all have state taxes, right? Um, can you can mm -hmm. you get can you get from the states then the the, uh, the number of tax paid sales, and um, okay. you know that would be a way to get at. Gets, I mean, more, mm -hmm. you know, the universe mm -hmm. of sales, basically legal sales, at least, right, without, with just using government yeah. data. And, yeah, yeah, so that might be something to consider. But, uh, but thanks yeah, again. Thanks. And, That's a great yeah. idea. I will dig into that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. I think uh, we have time for the last question. Um, most COPD patients don't require hospitalization. Do you have statistics about those two? Hmm. No, not really. Not at the moment. Um, yeah, it, it's it's nice yeah. for more data, more complete data. But you know, <laughs> all these yeah. challenges. Okay, uh, I think we are about time, and uh, thank you, Victoria. Okay. For the presentation. Um, so, Julia, uh, please take. Yeah, it. sure. Thank you so much, Victoria, for the very interesting presentation. And thank you, Mike and Tu, for serving as the moderator and discussing today. And we actually had a really good turnout today. We had over 100 people attending for the most of the seminar. It, it was really great. And thank you so much for the audience for your participation and hope you all have a great rest of the day. And then please stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for all the feedback and the questions. It was great. <laughs>